Okay, so we're trying that again. <laughs> that, yeah. that is not the technical check. Just make sure people are paying attention. Yeah, luckily I had a cow graphic. <laughs> yes, we had a hit all the time. Okay, try it again. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Just, like, okay. Hey, it's this lady. Okay. Hi. This is live. Okay. Hey, everybody. Hey, deskers. And welcome to Disco Lady Ada. Um, welcome to Disco Lady Ada. Um, yeah, we're back. Thank you. Last week we had some family stuff we we're doing, and now we are uh, back to our desks, uh, which is great. I, I miss my desk. Um, it's also good to see folks as well. Uh, this week was exciting. So you actually kicked off this week. You went to an event. Yeah. So let me just quickly talk about some stuff. Logistics. We have our full suite of shows this week from JP's Product Pick of the Week, 3D Hangouts with Noah Pedro, Show and Tell, Ask an Engineer, JP's Workshop, Deep Dive, and then all the videos throughout the week and more. Um, over the weekend, I went to Hope at St. John's University. Congratulations, 2600 and the Hope Conference. It was fantastic. Special thanks to St. John's University for hosting an amazing event. Um, I'm going to post up more stuff, but just to give you a taste. Wow, they still have the poster. Yes, just to give you a taste of what was happening there. I think this is the first time. Um, well, this isn't the first time that people took photos of the 2600 van. This is 1981. Dodge Ram before I think they like uh, became uh, Bell. A, 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 well, no, uh, like yeah, before Dodge came somewhere else. But I think it's the first time that someone has three D scanned the van. You scan the van. I scan the van. I am the man down by the river who scans vans. <laughs> um, okay, so you're gonna you're gonna be able to three D print a little hacker yeah. van. Yeah, and so not only will you be able to 3D print it, but I think I'm going to put it in video games, and so you can drive the 2600 van and, like, hack video games. That's fun. Cool. It's with the free Kevin sticker and everything. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah, Did you design the free Kevin sticker? I had a lot to do with the free Kevin movement. <laughs> yeah. If you go to uh, the documentary Freedom Downtime, you could see, like, a 19-year-old me leading a protest outside Miramax Studios. Um, so we did that, uh, and so uh, more ahead, but uh, super fun event, really good to see a lot of people in person. Um, it was uh, wholesome and heartwarming. Oh. So Lady Ada, what are you doing this week? Okay, so, you know, this week, I'm, I'm, well, first off, I tried to catch up on email because we had, we had so many visitors, which is wonderful. You know, we had uh, a lot of people who weren't able to visit for the last two years, um, family members and such, and so it was, it was really great to see people. Uh, but catching up a little bit. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to revisit, and like I know I have like 8,000 unfinished projects, but why not add another one? Um, which is, I'm thinking of um, de-zombifying this old project called uh, Blue Fruit Easy Key and Easy Link. Um, these were really cool um, Bluetooth classic boards that we designed like seven, eight years ago, uh, we worked with Di Ching, who was um, an NYU student at the time. I think we just graduated from ITP and actually wrote um, the initial firmware. It, you know, and we we actually got, in a, I think he wrote the firmware with like a kind of like pirated copy of CSR, um, eval, you know, IDE. And then we actually went and, and got a license to use CSR in the CSR chipset, which is what is used in like, um, you know, well, at the time, it was used in like 80% of, of serial, Bluetooth uh, serial and uh, HID boards. Now there's actually a lot of other chips. But um, so the, the cool thing was uh, we did get it working. The problem is that using CSR uh, really, 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 really was unpleasant. Um, I'll just show the boards off in case people aren't aware of them. So you want to go to my computer real fast? Yeah. So... Um, so there were a couple of them, and you know they're they're discontinued now. But there was one that was you know so we had to get these modules that had the CSR chipset, and we got them FCC certified, um, you know emitter certified, and like we had to get ones with tins, and um, we programmed the boards, which used like this really terrible like shark programmer thing that was like you know three hundred bucks. Um, it did, we did get it working. And it worked worked pretty well. So the Easy Link was a transparent. SPP protocol, Bluetooth Classic board. Um, what's interesting is is Bluetooth Classic had like seven profiles, 
and they were like set in stone. Like you could have it be audio or you could have it be a serial link or you could have it be HID, but like really like there was, it was very limited. It was like the classic Bluetooth and really like clearly tried to fix some of these problems by having customizable um, profiles and like, you know, what uh, endpoints there are for like the Bluetooth connection. Like how do you get, how do you read and write data from different um, elements? Whereas SPP really was your, like it really, really was just your Bluetooth. Because at the time, like, I don't even think USB was that popular yet um, when Bluetooth Classic was first invented. And so they were like, we just want to replace the RS-232 link, you know, so, you know, SPP was how they did it. Um, and SPP had, you know, one cool thing about it is it really, you know, in Windows or in Mac and Linux, it showed up as a COM port. Like it looked transparently like a serial port. Um, and so this easy link was basically like a, a FTDI cable, but without wires. Like, you know, you would, when you paired it to your computer, um, your Windows, Mac, or Linux computer, it would show up as a serial port or a COM port. And then you could send data back and forth. And we also got the um, DTR and RTS and CTS pins working. So if you got the control flow. And the reason that was cool is that when you had control flow, you could actually program like wirelessly um, an Arduino or an ESP32 board. It was kind of, kind of cool, uh, to be honest. Um, it, you know, it worked. And then you could, you know, you basically acted like a, like a FT232 or CP210N board. So um, the easy link was very neat. You know, the, the real secret was that we got the, um, the control lines working, uh, f- you know, basically flawlessly through the, the OS. The OS thought it was setting the DTR pin, the DTR pin would get set. Um, and then there was the easy key, which was um, same module, but programmed slightly differently. And this would act as a Bluetooth keyboard. And it was, um, it's interesting is BLE has keyboard support. BLE does not have SPP support. So you definitely need to use classic. BLE does have HID support, but really like 99% of things want to use Bluetooth classic for keyboard. And so um, this is Bluetooth classic and, and it's like the buttons were just like, you know, immediate key presses. And so it was just like, um, you know, transparent keyboard, uh, you know, generation um, device. So people would, you know, you could put this on a joystick and connect each button to the GPIO down here and it would just like magically show up as a keyboard and it would press keys and you could set what the key map you wanted and it was just like cool and awesome and everything. Um, so the problem is, is that, um, you know, we love this product and we, we were selling quite a few of them and then the company that made the modules like went out of business or like something weird happened and then like we couldn't find another place and we did and they were like we'll make them for you and then like we paid them and they didn't send them and then like it was just it was just like it was kind of a nightmare and like csr like absolutely like so we tricked csr into giving us a license um and i did it um i don't think this is bad i mean it's been like eight years so i think you can see what i did <laughs> so limitations are over yeah well i mean like csr i don't even know if they exist anymore i think they were like purchase 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 i think they were like broadcom or vago now but um, they would not answer my phone calls to or emails to get a license. And you needed a license. It was like a five thousand dollar license to use their IDE and get permission, you know, to to, to use um, the IDE and SDK to program the CSR chips. And so what I did was I went I went to DigiKeys. This is DigiKey actually helped me out here. Um, I went to DigiKey and I bought like they had a starter eval board kit and it was five thousand dollars. And part of the deal was like. Buy the eval board kit, you get two boards, a programmer, and you know, the license. Like it's a bundle deal, right? And so I was like, I, I bought the bundle deal, which was like a physical thing from DigiKey, and then um, they sent it to me. And so then that guy tried to activate the license, and CSR was like, Who are you? And like, we don't want you, you're weird, you're not a big company. And I actually had um, my DigiKey sales rep um, yell at CSR and say, We sold this to them, you have to give them the license key. Um, this was like in 2014. So that's how I got um, the license key for CSR. Uh, they, and I think I think like the day after that happened, they like turned off that capability of like getting around their system. Because uh, again, they really did not want individuals to have access to the CSR SDK. You know, honestly, you can download it, pirate it on the internet, I'm sure. Um, but because I was selling a product, I wanted to like do it right, you know? So I did it right. Anyways, I couldn't get the CSR chipset anymore. 
And I just, like, I was just, like, I had such a headache from this product. And, like, you know, I still have, like, thousands of, of modules that I can't use. Like, they're not programmed right and, like, they don't work. And it's, like, I just kind of was, like, I hate this and I want to. I was, like, I'm going to use BLE. I'm going to move to the NRF chipset, which was joyous to use in comparison. Um, but, you know, I still did really like these these products. And there are still a lot of uh, boards and chips that are programmed over UART. And so having this, was like, I was like, I, I want to bring this back. And so as I was, you know, I kind of forgot about this board. But then I was, I was working on the um, ESP32 V2 Feather. Um, you know, one of the things that I thought of was, um, you know, this little module can do Bluetooth Classic with ESP32. And the Espressif is like, way 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 more fun to work with than csr and it's like they, you know they probably have code for svp and hid even if it's not an arduino it's at least in the esp idf so i'm i you know like i'm doing like a meeting or something i was like oh i'm just gonna redesign the easy key an easy link i started with the easy link to use the pico module and it's and it, it's the same width which is really nice it's actually a little bit narrower no sorry it's about the same width but it's a little shorter so I got to make the board even a little bit tinier. And, um, you know, what's nice is, you know, I can put like a NeoPixel on it. So like a little, little micro NeoPixel here for status instead of just an LED because I'm like not dealing with this nightmare IDE SDK that, you know, I can't actually like really code anything. And it, like it worked great, but it was like, you, you know, you can only do what it does and you couldn't really do anything else. So, um, you know, well, we're going to get like, you know, the UART output and uh, it's like level shifting and a pairing button. Um, so this is kind of, you know, you can use any pin, but it's sort of my idea of like maybe like resuscitating this project, which I would I'd like to do. Because uh, people, I think, really liked it. So um, will it work? I don't know. But I thought I was in, I was in a heat stroke, from, you know, haze from this week's 90 plus degree weather. So I did that. So, you know, we'll, we'll order those PCBs in the next couple of weeks and, and we'll see how that goes. And one nice thing also about this is, um, you know, there's the module that has the external antenna. So people, if they want, if you want to program a board that's like 500 feet away, just get like a big ass 2.4 gigahertz antenna and you'll be able to do, you know, BLE, uh, Bluetooth classic from a far distance. So um, we'll see how that goes. I, will it work? I don't know. Uh, I'm working on it. Um, next up, ding, ding, ding. What's that sound, Phil? You need more cowbell. It's time for cowbell. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit of uh, a little bit of history with this. So one of the things that we needed to do was uh, come up with a, a name for these Pico W shields or whatever, and people were calling them uh, Peak House. And so uh, I'll look at, I'll look Jeff here. Uh, said, you know, what about cowbells? And uh, yeah. I mean, it was it was kind of spot on. We had done a video uh, where we did a, a cricket project, a, a robot project, and so we we did some iterations, and eventually, like, we got a logo, and we wanted to kind of go with like a, a dairy theme and like more cowbell um, in the the SNL skit with uh, Christopher Walken, um, and uh, you know, it just kept going, and. Uh, <laughs> You just wanna you wanna I'll see the cow. Yeah, so more cowbell. All right, so Okay, uh, so to your cowbells. Uh so and then you know, so you know, like basically, um I've just been like so busy that I never really made any Pico add ons. Um also because we had a feather we made an RP twenty forty feather and so I was like, Well, that way you can take advantage of the ecosystem. But I think like this Pico W, um the fact that they're making more boards in this form factor. Like, one is, like, okay, interesting, but two is, is, a, is a trend. So uh, the fact that there's two made me think, like, oh, you know, I should, like, make some boards that work with the Pico W, especially since, like, you know, the module, I can't get a Wi-Fi module plus RP2040 for less than the cost of the board. It's just they're selling it, like, at cost. And they're buying so many chips from Broadcom that they can, you know, if they're selling the non-W version for 4 bucks and they sell the version... Um, with W for two bucks, it's like I can't get, you know, Wi-Fi certified module for like less than that price, anyways. Um, so you know, I thought that'd be interesting to like maybe make some add-on boards. So, you know, the one thing I started with is I always just start with a prototyping board. So this is, you know, the it's just, it fits exactly on the Pico W or the Pico, and then um, you know every pin is broken out, and there's some power lines, 
Uh, these are the, the power buses, and then these are grounds. They're the white markings of grounds. And then I added a little reset button, a right angle reset button that you could solder on because I like to have a you know, reset button. Um, I thought that'd be handy for people to be able to you know reset it uh, remotely um, if necessary. So this is um, the first one, the Proto, and then... You know, the thing I always do is I always make a, a TFT version. So, part, you know, part of the work I did was actually making the, the board definitions for making cowbells, which is like I have to make this um, object that has this dual SMT connector. And I really do like the dual SMT connector. We use it in the, um, the Feather TFT. Um, so if you look at, like, the Feather TFT uh, on the back, I have this... Um, these dual headers, you know, one, they're, they're two by N and they're connected through. I, I just connect them on the PCB. And the reason I like this is that if you connect, if you want to plug in a board, like um, here's, you know, one with the ESP plugged in, you can see there's one row of pins down the edge that you can always connect to. So like, First off, I think they're mechanically very stable, the two by ends. They're more stable, in my opinion, than like just the one row ones. But, and they're also a little flatter um, because you know, they have pads on both sides. Um, but the second is that if you want to jumper to connect to it, it's like if there's free pins, I want to make it so it's like you can easily connect to them if you wanted to. So um, having the headers on either side. So that was the first step was to just create um, this definition you can see on the on the back you know uh this is the outline and this is the usb and then there's these two pads and then the board you know has the outline of here so it's good you know it's gonna be bigger than just the pcb but you know honestly i think that's fine the pcb is a little skinny so um so this one i'm starting with having like a tft and maybe like four buttons or maybe i'll have a joystick i was just kind of messing around this isn't like anywhere near done um, but then I wanted to add a SD card because a lot of times if I have a TFT board, I'm using SPI peripheral. I want to add SD because I can have images or like video or whatever. Like usually if you have an image, if you have a TFT, you want some way to store assets as well. And, and the, the Pico W and the Pico especially have very little disk space. Um, the Pico W even less because you have to store the firmware for the Wi-Fi module and the firmware has to include the SSL stack. And so... You really have only maybe a couple hundred K left. Um, so having an external, you know, these SD card slots are like, you know, a dollar, but then you can add like gigabytes of space super easily um, for very cheaply as well. Um, so the only thing was, I was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, I'll, I'll put it on the back. Um, and then, so I was on the back and I was like, yay, I'll just like stick it here. And I was like, oh my God, this isn't gonna fit. Um, it's just a little bit too narrow. And so what I need to do is I have to find um, a micro SD card that will, hold on, let me measure. I need something that's less than uh, 12 millimeters, basically. And this one is um, like 13 or 13 and a half millimeters. But that space between um, the headers, I need, I need that to, um, I need that to give me more space. Uh, sorry, I need to have the SD card fit between that space because I want to use SMT headers for manufacturability easiness. Um, and so it's worth it for me to find an alternative part that maybe will squeeze in here, which is what we're going to do for the great search. Well, before we pop off to that, though, let's oh, do yeah? some questions. Yeah. Um, did the zero ohm resistor on the SP32S2 QT? Pi antenna network provide a good enough signal not to need to be flushed out Pi network. I don't understand their question. You should signal, post on the forums. Signal not to need to be flushed out Pi network. I don't know. Okay. How do you post on the forums? Maybe, I... yeah, but maybe maybe a antenna, does the zero resistor provide a good enough signal to not need to be flushed out Pi network? Okay. Uh, okay. This is a comment. Uh, thanks for preserving the pinout in the first six pins of the ADS. 1115 16-bit ADC breakout board. I was able to make PCBs that's compatible with the original stemmer versions. Yay. Okay. Next up. Yeah. Um, I guess for me, the core thing about the add-ons to any Pico boards would be an external way to control power, approximate deep sleep, 
as the Pico isn't exactly a very power efficient chip in terms of deep sleep itself. I know that's the approach that Pimariner are using for their products that integrate Pico. I mean, the the chip itself, you know, does go into a sleep mode. It doesn't go into ultra deep sleep. Um, yeah, that said, it can go to under under a milliamp. I think, you know, the Pico W does have an enable pin, and so you could put an on off switch there. Um, but you know, it's not. I don't think the Pico W or the Pico was. I don't know how much they were really designed for ultra low power. I have to look at the schematic to see how they wire up the Wi-Fi and whether you can you can make it really low. But the thing is, is that you're not going to get as good as the ESP32, which can go into deep sleep at like 50 microamps. Okay. Like that's well, definitely not possible with the RP2040. I got a clarification for that other question. And then, uh, but let's first go to this question. Thoughts on adding a quick connector to the ESP32 Pico board? You're working on example, could add a Neo key one by four board and do different tasks by button or marble. The ESP32 um, Pico, I don't, I don't know what they're talking about. The ESP32... Pico board that you're working on. I guess you're working on ESP32 Pico board? This is the, um, this is not an ESP32. This is the RP2040. Yeah. And um, we have a cutie pie or, you know, our, our Feather and the cutie pie ESP32s have uh, a cutie, a semi QT connector on them, yeah. Okay, well, maybe I messed up that, but... I don't, I don't okay, know. Okay, next up. Um, the question before is, is a zero ohm resistor good enough not to need to tune the antenna on the Cutie Pie ESP32 S2? Um, the, the, the resistors, the, I, I don't know what they're referring to, but on the ESP32 Cutie Pie, we don't use a zero ohm resistor. Okay, if I were to put an RTC, that would be great, so I guess real-time clock. I mean, RTC does not necessarily mean it, it has a low power mode. Like, you have to, um, you have to be able to disable everything you want for, I mean, the, the RP2040 simply does not sleep at less than about a half a milliamp or point, point 0.2 milliamps in the DC. Oh, the easy key is the thing that they were referring to, not the, uh, uh, um, ESP, uh, I, I don't, I mean, I think I, I could add, you know, pins you could connect I squared C, but I don't know if I would make it a full dev board at that point. It's like you should use a feather. You know, okay. like the codal one on both. And then, uh, yeah, to be clear, the idea of having external power timer control for the Pico is enabled to run uh, with super low power mode, like with the ABLIC chip you showed in MPI. You would just, you would wire, I mean, like, the thing is, is that nobody's going to pay $4 extra for accessory just because it does low power. So yeah. you'd want to wire up something separately for those needs, because it's like the, the Pico W, I don't, it's just, the RP2040s is not, you're not going to get less than 50 microamps uh, the Cal way you do with the ESP32. Cowbell would be the thing supplying power, so you can just cut it off entirely. You know what? I also want a pony. But I, like, <laughs> maybe maybe I'll make like, a low power bell, but it's just like, it's, it, it, I, I want to really express, if something is not designed for low power, it's like, yeah. it's, just, it's just not. Like, people who want to use Bluetooth LE with ESP32, they're like, wow, it's not very low power. It's like, it's just not designed for I that. Feel like, I feel like when something's not designed for low power and when people uh, try to make it low power, then everyone complains and say, this really isn't low power. It's, it's very hard yeah. to take something that just is not designed for that and make it for that. Yeah. And I don't, I'll look more carefully at the Pico W, but if it's not designed for it, it's okay, really so the, the mag hard. Tag, the mag tag, we got to do low power with it. It's amazing. It lasts a month. And that's the expectation. If, if we didn't, do that if it only lasted a day people would say it's not really low you know that's not low power it's also is that what people even want i mean yeah. like well, we'll I, I will say that there's like you know a couple dozen people who really care about low power stuff but like yeah we'll see you know most keep, people keep are posting, like keep posting some of the things that you yeah. want to do with it because that always helps us too so yeah we'll, we'll take a look at everything but again yeah, yeah. It, the rp2040 is not a low power chip all that's right clarify. great search them Every single week, the ladies are power of engineering to find things on digikey.com. Thanks, digikey. Lady Ada, what is a great search this week? Okay, so this week, I'm going to get to it. Uh, we're doing a ultra slim micro SD card. So let's go to the computer so I can, I can show this thing again. Uh, so I want a micro SD card slot that is not wide like this, 
but is, because this is too wide to fit between these pads and it in interferes, I need something that's less than um, 12 millimeters wide. Um, so let's go to the overhead and I'll show how, how wide these things are, too wide. Okay, so, um, so this is uh, 14 millimeters wide, which is, like I said, way too wide. Now, you know, ironically, on, on the Pico W or the Pico, you know, this would fit because I'm not using, these don't use SMT headers, use through hole headers, but on my accessories, I want to use SMT headers. And so like the pads come out to the side. Um, and so, you know, that one fit, and this like barely fits even here. Uh, so one thing I did think of was like, oh, you know, I looked at um, the Teensy, which I had one hanging around. And um, this one actually is like almost exactly 12 millimeters. So I knew that this was possible to find something that would fit uh, perfectly in between um, those pads. Uh, I just need to use um, need to use my, my DigiKey search capabilities. So um, one thing to just note for is that this is not a push-pull. What, like, what you... What you get when you get that extra width is there's the spring here, and the spring is what lets you do the push-push um, ability to, you know, you push it in, and then, you know, when you do this, it, like, flies out and across the room. Um, and then this is uh, push and pull type. So, you know, there's trade-offs, like, the, you know, the Raspberry Pi computers also changed. They were push-push, and then I think, you know, that was the, the spring can break. Um, it's not really meant for, you know, infinite insertion removals. Um, this one, you know, it's, it's not as like elegant cause you have to yank it, but, uh, it's skinnier and, and you don't have the spring that can break. So let's go to my computer. And, uh, so we did, um, actually cover the SD card holder in a previous great search. Um, you can see it here. Like this is this part. Um, I use it everywhere and it's it's wonderful and it's great, but again, it's it's a little bit too wide. Um, so what I want to do is I want to find an alternative, something that does very similar stuff. And you can see this lovely rendering. Uh, there's lots of these in stock, which is great, but I want something that's again a little skinnier. Um, and one thing to note is that the the size is not documented. It's not a search searchable element, which happens sometimes, especially for some connectors, you don't get dimensions as a searchable thing. So what you have to do is just look at them and then check the data sheet and just read each one until you find the one. Or, you know, you do what I did. You find a board that has the part and you're like, okay, I know that this exists. I just need something that looks like that. So let's look for a uh, active uh, micro SD um, holder and let's view similar. Um, so already we got a couple options. So this is the hinge type. Um, these are very slim, but I don't, this is not a good board fix. I want people to be able to remove the card from the side. The, these hinge ones are really good when you have the SD card in the middle of your PCB. So you want to be able to like flip it out, you know, remove it and you don't have to have an edge. Whereas the SD card, I'm, you know, the card holders I'm looking at, they need to be on the edge because you can, you, you know, there's nothing in the way you can pull the card out. So I do want to um, remove hinged lid. So I'm going to select everything but hinged and then uh, apply that to get rid of like the 12 that don't have it. Um, okay, so now we've got a couple options. So, you know, the first one, um, first one we've got here is, is, you know, what I've got already. It's got the spring. This one, I've actually seen this before. I saw this on a, um, they're ultra, ultra tiny. And like, just like the ends go in, it's like, it's kind of weird. Um, one thing that is nice is it, it's high up above the board. And so a lot of people use this. Um, you can put it in the middle of the board because often it'll float above any like resistors or maybe slim capacitors or even a chip. And um, because it's not, the, the SD card doesn't go up against the PCB. It's actually kind of levitated. The only thing that's weird about this is um, I don't like that the SD is like, it's really exposed because only the contacts are connected. So I've seen this board used, I'm uh, sorry, this, this connector. It is by far like the most compact, you know, simplest SD card holder, but um, there's no mechanical strength to it in my opinion. Um, so the next one is, um, 
we've got these amphenol parts. So this one has a spring, so I think we can't use this one. This one looks like it's very similar to uh, this uh, lady. So let's look over here in the specs. Um, so this one, let's scroll down. We can see the dimensional spec. They don't. They don't have dimensional specifications. Why would they add that? This must be an incomplete data sheet. Okay, well, that's not very helpful. Let's try this one. Okay, this is much better. Um, so I love it when the data sheets are scans of like documents. So this one, uh, I think this is actually the same part that's on the Teensy. Um, because this is 11.95 millimeters, so it's like it's again very very narrow. So this is like you know the one I think I'm going to go with. Um, however, there's a couple other possible options. Um, let's look at this one. Maybe this one has. Yeah, this one has. Also, this is um, 11. You know, um, 0.95 millimeters. One thing I do like is it has a switch on it. Um, I like my SD card. Most most SD card slots these days. Do have a switch it lets you know that um, the card is inserted or removed so before you perform any um, SD card communication um, you can check to make sure that the card is in place so you don't end up hanging on like waiting for data to re uh, respond nothing I don't think this really works but like if you are writing data to an SD card you can kind of detect right when it's about to be removed and like you might be able to flush the data really quickly although i don't know how how fast you can do that before the contacts um lose connection but these are all really good options uh so let me just look for ones that are in stock and then let me look for uh pricing you know make sure the pricing at five thousand pieces good so yeah these are cheaper for sure, um, and you can see even the, the thickness of the plastic at the bottom there that levitates it. Um, and there's a couple options of these super skinny ones. This one's very cheap. This one has that spring, so it's gonna be too wide. Um, this is a flip top actually, which is, shouldn't have made it into the search, but it did. So the, the one that is the least expensive, it's basically a dollar at the 5,000 piece mark, is this Amphenol. So this is what I'm gonna probably go with. Um, it looks like, you know, the, the part on the Teensy doesn't say Amphenol, so I think this is a generic layout component. Probably Amphenol first came out with it, and then other people made um, variations that are very similar. I'm going to try this. I think uh, this is a pretty standard part, so I should be able to get, you know, I don't like to get connectors that are only available for one supplier, so I'm going to first make sure that this pinout and pad, um, like the push-pull SD card, is available for multiple places. And then I'll try it out. But the good news is that, you know, once I lay out the pins, um, it'll work with all the code exactly the same because the contacts are exactly the same. So this is my my great search pick. And that's a great search. Where in the world is that part I need? The great search with DJ King. Okie dokie. Okay. All right, let me see if there's any other things. Yeah. Uh, da -da 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 -da. I think that is it. We did it. Okay. Okay, good work, Lady Ada. All right, cool. Well, I'll think about the low-power um, cowbell stuff. I think it's... I, I have to see how they set up the the power circuitry because I know that there is this... Um, there's this buck converter, and it's probably a pretty good buck converter. Um, but, yeah, it's like... it's um, it's It's interesting to see... You know, a lot of a lot of low cost dev boards are, are are designed for like they're optimized for one thing. I feel like the Pico W is really optimized for price, um, but I do know that there's an enable pin, so you might be able to like use something to like turn off the enable pin, and then you set like a timer, and then it like brings it back up. But you know, you're going to, I will say, you're going to have to end up paying a couple dollars for an RTC, and so then it's like, I, I think people might be like, well, why don't I just use like an ESP32 instead, which has the built-in um, low power capability. Yeah. So I guess the question is like, how much, you know, it's like, it's it's this very delicate balance of, um, you tack on boards to add capability, you tack on chips to add capability, 
you know, at what point do you, are you like, well, I should just use like a chip that has all built in? Just get a big honking USB power bank. Or, yeah, I mean, like, that's what I've always told people. They're like, how do I, you know, it's like I have, like, 100 NeoPixels and, like, a, a servo. And they're like, how do I estimate how long it takes? And I'm like, well, you power up the battery, and then you run your thing, and then you count how long it lasts. But they're like, well, can't I do math? And I'm like, you're changing how many LEDs are lit and when the power, the motor is driven, like, every second. There's no there's no constant current anymore. It's so spiky. You gotta um, do some rinse and repeat measurements. Yeah, like we did the we did the mag tag. Like I estimated it, but really, like we just put it on our fridge and waited, and then said like, okay, this is what it works out as. Because also batteries aren't linear. Um, you know, you're, you're they self discharge. The the current draw, you know, when you're in deep sleep mode is one thing, but then when you wake up and you spike it, like you're it's not linear. You know, you can estimate it, but it's not linear. So nothing really beats actual testing and then if it's like oh i need to last twice as long i always just say like get a twice as big battery right. that's another thing like lipo batteries honestly are like three dollars you can get like a big one for and six. that <laughs> is the desk of lady to see y'all during the week thank you so much for spending time with us good questions and more tonight see you around okay bye everybody